exam. I don't think we'll have an exam next time. Probably the time after next we'll have enough to have an exam. So uh, we'll see at the end of this period how we're doing. But I wouldn't think we'd have an exam till the time after next. That, uh, would that be suitable to you guys? It would take the whole period to write something. But um, let's proceed. Uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to look at uh, you're supposed to be reading Rudowski if you ever got the book and I wanted to just uh, switch over a bit to France here and um, didn't mean to lock you out so um, We've got a good selection here, I think, somewhere, of the uh, of the questions. Napoleon asked the Sanhedrin that he called. So. I guess you'd say we're approximately maybe um, So, you know, France was a different situation entirely to what was going on in Germany. And um, the picture from Mendelssohn Dohm, well, the people of that kind that we were dealing with, is in central part of Europe. Uh, and that was the late 1700s. Germany hadn't even really coalesced into a nation yet. But, uh, you know, in France, they, there was a lot of agitation and uh, discontent that bubbled over in the so-called French Revolution. Mentioned a few of the things about it last time. But the French community had been developing from much earlier. There had been uh, Jews coming into southern France from Spain after the uh, persecutions in Spain. Um, can you give, give me an idea of what you know about the persecutions in Spain? 1492? Well, 1492 is the key date, and, but uh, it didn't end then. Because then you had the problem of getting the people, you know, basically uh, what we call an inquisition. And actually that's when it was <laughs> established, uh, getting the people who were faking who had converted just to stay in Spain and were still practicing their native customs, primarily Jews, perhaps some Muslims. I'm not sure it was really directed too much against Muslims because I think most Muslims just gave up the ship and uh, you know they understood that uh, when the state commanded you to do something on pain of death or exile, you did it. 
the Jews uh, were used to sort of uh, trotting, sliding by. So though a lot left, and went to uh, North Africa, the Ottoman Empire, and so on, some stayed. And so there was a constant pressure, like people like Spinoza in Holland. He's functioning in Holland in the six, early 1600s. So his people would have come into Holland in some time in the, he wasn't more than, I think, a generation or two in Holland from Spain. So he would be uh, coming into Spain somewhere in the um, 1500 period, and coming into Holland, coming from Spain. I told you before, why was uh, uh, Holland uh, in any way uh, involved with Spain? Do you have any sense of the history of this period? The trading company? Well, there was the East India Company, sure. But that's because the Jews who left Spain had all those contacts back in the Orient that they had earlier from the Mediterranean and the Far East trade, and therefore they they just tra uh, transferred the contacts and the ability to uh, have those associations and uh, trade uh, relations to Amsterdam, uh, which then benefited greatly. Amsterdam you know, really did flourish. I mean, we don't want to say the Jews bring flourishing, but, but often it did help, and in fact, probably was part of the root cause, which is why countries wanted Jews as well as not wanted them. They wanted them for the economic benefit, but they didn't want them for the actual having to be there. <laughs> so there was a sort of a, um, schizophrenic approach to, and, but the Dutch were, I think, fairly um, generous and, uh, you know, there already been a reformation in Holland to some extent, though Holland is uh, somewhat well split between uh, Reformation people and people who didn't reform, uh, high, high church, uh, Catholicism, and so on. And you know, Belgium is uh, another situation. You know, most of the, there's a lot of trouble in southern Holland and Belgium, even to this day. Uh, there's a group called the uh, Walloons, and then there are the, um, the um, people who speak, um, the Dutch language. I forget what they're called, but uh, there's another group that are against the Walloons. And uh, they're the Dutch speaking people. The Walloons are the French speaking people. Basically, the French speaking people came to the fore in Belgium. And, and Catholicism still reigns strong in Belgium. There, there is no Reformed Dutch church in Belgium. You know, these things really come right down the national boundaries. Well, anyway, France somehow, uh, Spain somehow was the protector of these places. And the emperor of Spain, through some sort of inheritance structure, thought that he had inherited the, uh, the lands of the Low Countries, uh, Belgian, Holland, and so on. And so he had, um, he had uh, brought his armies in. How many have seen any of Velasquez paintings? There's a, Velasquez painting where they're all holding their uh, lances up in the air, and it's a very beautiful painting. It was a Spanish painting of Velasquez in the 1500s, early 1600s. I think it's called the Peace of, of uh, Jeddah or Jena or something like that. And it's a it's a battle that was fought in 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 Holland. And the Spanish armies were in Holland, and then the English armies got in on the on the uh, on the thing. And it's a very mixed up period. You know the wars in Europe worth studying if you're a historian from the 1500s uh, all across Holland, Belgium, Germany, English armies going on the continent. You know, you know Winston Churchill, they've made a lot of uh, fuss about him and uh, his uh, contribution to the uh, last century and defense of England. He prided himself on his descent from a famous British military hero from this period. Do you know the name of that person? Uh, it's called the Duke of Marlborough. The Duke of Marlborough. He was a Churchill. He was the first Churchill. And because of his victories in, uh, in Germany in these places, he was given by one of the Protestant English queens of that period, Queen Anne, or one of these, you know, uh, a, a, a title and, uh, you know, an estate 
Godwin, and that's where Churchill was born in this, uh, in this uh, um, I think it's called, it's outside of a place called Woodstock, Woodstock, England, not New Hampshire, um, or not New York. And um, it's really beautiful, the Marlborough, the Duke of Marlborough's uh, Woodstock estate, is a, it's absolutely an incredible place. And um, that's where Churchill was born, so he felt he had this, uh, this ancestry, but it was all from these wars that this Duke of Marlborough made his name, and Churchill wrote a biography of this Duke of Marlborough. He was a famous military, uh, English military hero who fought on the continent and won innumerable battles. It was Protestant Catholic battles. Part of the battleground was Holland. So a lot of these people went to Holland, the, and they, uh, they had a name, actually, um, you know, the ones who had stayed in, in Spain and then had to leave uh, because of the persecutions and things and the Inquisitions, they were called Moranos. You've heard that word. Uh, the Spanish say it means pig. Whether that's how it developed because they supposedly wouldn't eat pork or whether it was a play on their uh, calling them pigs. Uh, it's a very odd uh, um, title or, or no, uh, nomenclature to give. So the Moranos uh, spread out into these areas. Spinoza then is from a Murano family that went to Holland. And because that part of Holland was Protestant, he was well received. I told you when Cromwell uh, fought the revolution against the British monarch, Parliament against the king. Uh, England had only just become Protestant. What king brought about Protestantism in England? Henry VIII. Henry VIII. Henry VIII. You know that big sort of heavy sort of chap that we show with six wives. And he was beheading all the wives because he didn't want the Vatican to get control again. And, uh, you know, it was all these interests, you know, they have a lot of dramas on television. You probably have seen them, The Six Wives of Henry VIII. They have, uh, it's dramatized, it's on the History Channel. Then you have Elizabeth in the movies and so on and so forth. You know, she's the descendant of one of the women that he beheaded, which is why she never married. So she became the Virgin Queen because she wouldn't marry, because she didn't want to get in this problem of, uh, you know, what was going to happen with what husband they were going to force on her. And that's why we have a place in America called what? Virginia. 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 Named after her because she was the Virgin Queen. And, um, you know, if you saw the pictures of her later in life, she's all made up in white. Uh, she, she powdered her, her, her skin. She wore white clothes. She, she whitened her hair and so on to sort of make this apparition of this, uh, of this, uh, image that she wanted to project. She was a very clever politician. But in any case, in, in any event, um, during her reign, uh, they were still fighting the Catholic return. You know, Shakespeare, his plays are a lot about that, because he was under the gun of Elizabeth's secret police. You say, why was Shakespeare under the gun of uh, there have been some good uh, History Channel things on it, and uh, very well done. He, because he, uh, his family was uh, Catholic sympathizers. And they were against the Elizabeth monarchy. And uh, one of his uh, first cousins was a famous poet, who was a Catholic poet, who was executed by Elizabeth. And he always had to hide his sympathies. But in the plays, he was always attacking things. It's very interesting, really interesting to get into a deep history of uh, Shakespeare, where he gets these ideas from and so on. But he was always under suspicion. So this situation was uh, kept on going throughout the Elizabethan period. So you know, it's good for dates. Everybody knows when the Spanish Armada was defeated. What date was that? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Uh, I'm going to upgrade your, 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 your knowledge here an easy day. So that was when the last try of the Spanish, and see the Spanish were active in trying to take England back, active in the Low Countries and so on. 
It was all part of these wars, uh, and, the, and the wars went on because the Duke of Marlborough is the next generation. He's not even he's not even fighting yet. Uh, he's in the 1600s. The wars have moved to Europe against this someone called Charles V, who was called the Holy Roman Empire. I think he was a Habsburg ruler, but he he ruled Spain too. It's very odd. All of it's very very curious, and I'm not a great expert on it. But. Um, it's an easy date to remember that the struggles are still going on in the late 1500s. So then Cromwell really puts pay because there's still the suspicions are there. Because they bring in a king from uh, Scotland because Elizabeth doesn't have any children and, and, uh, and, and he uh, was originally a Catholic but he agreed to convert to Protestantism, James I, which is why we have the King James Bible because they, uh, they translated the Bible into the common tongue at that time. So that's the early 1600s. So he was, uh, you know, he, he stayed faithful, but his children, I think it was Charles uh, I, James II, Charles II, I don't know which one was finally beheaded by Cromwell, but they were making uh, plans to return English, England to the Church of Rome's fold. And Cromwell and his people uh, found out about it, objected to it. Mary Queen of Scots was one of these people who they were involved with. They, they disposed of her too in the previous generation. She was a Catholic uh, a monarch and so on. So that was all going on. This struggle was going on. So Cromwell, 1640s, so it's an easy day to remember. America had already been uh, settled. Plymouth Colony, 1620. Pilgrims are these Cromwell-type uh, English Protestant Puritans who are settling the New World. You know, it's before Cromwell, so they're trying to find some sort of sanctuary. And then the Cromwell affairs in England, and Cromwell, of course, is just total Puritan, uh, very military-minded, very capable guy. But he invites the Jews back to England for the economic aspect of the thing, and he invites them back from Holland. That's where he invites them back. And from that moment on, Jews are returning to England. So these things are happening all over. So in France, you never thought I'd get back to where I was, but I sometimes have to <laughs> fill in here. You can tell people historical things, but if you don't give them any background to pin it on, they're lost, right? So if you don't have any sort of uh, um, you know, plugs to put things in, then you don't know where you are. So I try to uh, give you something, and you have to go further in your own lives if you're interested history and try to, you know, get a hold of it further over your own readings, but I try to give it to you a little bit. So these Muranos were coming across into southern France in the, um, you know, 1500s, early 1600s, and you see these are Sephardim. Remember I told you what Sephardim were? I'll do it again, but... I'll just write the two things down. I am in Hebrew is always a plural. Sephardim, Ashkenazim. What are Sephardim? Huh? That's Ashkenazim. Uh, Sephardim are what? Jews from Iberian Peninsula. Spain, yeah, Jews from Iberian Spanish Jews, but. Later, the term began to cover the whole Jewry around the uh, southern and eastern Mediterranean. So everybody, even if you were in Egypt, even, even today now in Israel, the, Israel is totally divided between Ashkenazi. And, uh, you go to the country and, you know, not, all this is alive and well. You know, you walk into the country and, you know, are you a Sephardi or are you an Ashkenazi? I mean, that's just like almost the first question anyone asks anybody. It means, are you an Oriental Jew from... Uh, south of the Mediterranean and across to Iraq and down to Yemen or into Turkey or the Balkans. The Balkans were, I told you, had their own um, language. A mixture of um, Spanish and uh, Hebrew called what? Ladino. Ladino, right. And then in, uh, the other Jews are known, I don't know why, are Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi after what they thought was the biblical name for Germany. I don't know if it was or it wasn't. But that's where um, the idea that they spoke a kind of guttural German came from. And the Jews did 
in Europe speak among each other a kind of guttural German mixed with Hebrew and written in Hebrew characters. And you've all heard of it. It's almost um, it's a language that's disappearing. But it isn't, oh, Hitler really, <laughs> Hitler really gave it a tremendous uh, pulverizing because all the people he annihilated, except for the ones he brought up from the Balkans, Greece, and uh, the islands of Greece, uh, Corfu, and places like that. And he, he, he went after those people too, as I told you. People in the camps actually saw these people come with their suitcases and didn't dare tell them where they were going. They were all nice and neat with neat little suitcases and they were walking right to the gas chambers. And they were people from Corfu, Rhodes. People who had no part in this European struggle whatsoever. And they just rounded them up. It didn't matter, you know. They didn't. They didn't really care. Anything like that. No, no pity. Total remorseless pitilessness. So there's a lot of atoning to do, but I don't think uh, I have it to do on the day of atonement. There's lots of people who need to do some atonement on this earth. A lot of atoning to be done somewhere. That's never going to get done, obviously. But in any case, that's. They all came to be called Sephardim, even though it's ridiculous to call a Jew from Yemen a Sephardi, isn't it? <laughs> it's really ridiculous. But that's uh, because Sephardi were the so-called dominant culture, coming from the refugees from Spain across North Africa and into the Ottoman Empire. Istanbul became the center. And then I told you, Saloniki in Greece was a seaport where even the stevedores were, were Jews, which is quite rare in the European sphere. So you have to divide it. The European sphere then are Ashkenazis and they were expelled from France, Germany, England, places like that in the as the Italian bankers took over, I told you. So 11, 12, 1300, 1400s, 1400s was the last expulsion from Spain. But then, you know, they started to re uh, re recoalesce slightly in the 15, 16, 17, in the period we're doing, 17, 1800s. So there's a, a, a sweep coming back and also to America. You know, the original settlers in America, Jewish settlers, were what? They're Sephardi. Because they were escapees from Spain mostly and Portugal. And they came to cities like New York. I think the first uh, community was in Rhode Island because it was a free community. I think it was in Newport. There's a, uh, I think it's a Judah Truro synagogue or something. If you go to Newport, Rhode Island, you'll see it. It's a very old synagogue there. And others down in the southern part of the United States. But most like the, I'm not I'm very good at this, but um, this was Jews of America. But I think that the treasurer of the Confederacy there's a fellow called Judah P. Benjamin, as I recall. Judah P. Benjamin, he was, um, what's the name of the Confederate president? What was his name? Jefferson, Jefferson Davis is Secretary of the Treasury. Lee. No, he was a general. Uh, Jefferson Davis is, was the cabinet in Richmond. And his Secretary of the Treasury was Judah P. Benjamin. I think that was his name. And he was the financier of the Southern, you know, not so much of the war, but you know, because Jews were considered to know finance, as uh, to some extent they still are. You get to uh, get the people, I mean, who made Clinton's economy run? It was his Treasury Secretary. Uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, Clinton's Treasury Secretary, do you remember him just four or five years ago? Uh, he was from a big Wall Street investment company. Uh, Greenspan? Huh? Greenspan? One of Greenspan's another one, but he, he was uh, not Secretary of the Treasury. He's called, um, what's he called, the Federal Reserve Chairman. That's different. But his successor, and in there, was too, yeah. But the other guy who was Clinton, who really made the economy hum, we've already forgotten about him, but he was very well liked, and uh, he was Clinton's, uh, he made Clinton, Clinton do anything about uh, finance. And he had this really sharp guy. So it, it does go on like that. It, it does go on like that. Um, they understood high finance, uh, and they were highly sought after. So in southern France, this was happening. I told you, 
a very famous uh, French essayist, I think it's Montaigne, who came from, uh, I think, Toulouse in southern France. He was a Murano background and so on. And he was writing in the late, uh, mid, late, uh, I think, uh, maybe 15, 1600, somewhere in there. He was very famous essays. So uh, there were, there were uh, Sephardim in the south, and um, there also were Ashkenazim coming in through Alsace-Lorraine in the German border area. Alsace-Lorraine is the area, if you don't know it, between Germany and France that they're always fighting over. So, for instance, um, I think it's Count Mirabeau, his pretty famous name, uh, wants the, the French National Assembly after the French Revolution. Uh, to apply the rights of man and citizenship, along with another prelate called Abbe Gregoire, whatever, and they were doing uh, to make them uh, free and independent persons, enfranchise them, give them the vote, and uh, basically their um, their philosophy was. To the Jew as an individual, everything. In other words, we won't hold back anything. After, after the revolution in 1789, of course, in America, it was never a question. I don't think these problems existed. Everybody was given citizenship here except the Afro-American issue. And free Afro-Americans, I think, had citizenship too. It was the problem of the ownership situation, mostly in the South, that was the issue for 100 years here. But um, as far as citizenship rights, um, you know, there was no problem with that. Anyway, their thing as a nation, as a national group, the Jews as a nation, as an individual, everything as a nation, nothing. I think the French are still following that, that rule today, actually, which is part of the meddling they're doing in the Middle East. <laughs> Anything they can do to undermine the situation in the Middle East, uh, you know, and curry favor with the uh, Islamic world, etc., and uh, you know, heap, uh, heap uh, at least propaganda abuse on Israel, they do, and it's got quite a few different motivations. So um, that's the situation in France prior to this Napoleonic calling of a Sanhedrin. Now we have the actual, um, the actual uh, declaration of the assembly here on page 18 in uh, this source book, Modern Jewish History. Um, this, let's see, what does he say, for instance? Um, I think it comes earlier than that, on page 14, the acts of the Israelite deputies of France and Israel and, and, and Italy. Uh, this is around the year 1806, it would seem. Napoleon is in the midst of his wars. He needs as much manpower as he can get. Uh, if you read the introduction to this on page 14, the assembly wanted to declare France's Jews Frenchmen, faithful subjects determined to conform in everything to the laws which ought to regulate the conduct of all Frenchmen. But uh, they could no longer declare themselves, at least as far as Napoleon saw these things, as a nation within a nation. Jewish law would have to yield without exception to French law. And I think Jews had basically accepted that. That's, again, part of the social contract. You have to uh, wear your laws and contract, and that's what Mendelssohn was trying to work out. He didn't get to a final, uh, final working out of the situation. But, um, you know, to get the protection of the state and to enjoy the citizenship rights, you have to put yourself under the you know, constitutional laws of that state. We have the same problem here in America today with uh, new immigrants coming in from different uh, parts of the world. 
a lot of people haven't yet grasped the fact they come here for economic benefit. Oh, I go to America so I can thrive, so I can make money, and you know, be a businessman. It, no matter what country you come from, it doesn't matter. East, West, South, or North. They haven't yet realized that there's a constitution here. And look, I'm from Eastern Europe, my people, or Germany, France, and Eastern Europe. I mean, I just take this as a given. I didn't, my people didn't fight the Revolutionary War. I don't know how many of your people fought the Revolutionary War. Uh, maybe we have a few daughters of the, sons of the American Revolution in this class. I, I don't want to ask. Uh, okay, anyone here a daughter of the American Revolution? Anyway, if there is one of you here, or a son of the American Revolution, that's our organization that calls themselves this, you know, back east. Uh, okay, you did it. You fought it. <laughs> you produced it. But all these other people have come in to participate in it, right? And the thing that binds us all together, and the binding glue, is the American Constitution. It's sort of like a new law of Moses. It's voted on by the people. Uh, you may not like all its clauses, I don't think the framers liked all of its clauses, but as I said, it's the best that they could do, and Franklin said, I'm not even sure that we could get a better one, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, and so it's the best they could get at that time. You may not like the electoral college, electoral college, things like that. I don't know what issues you may have with the American Constitution, but that's it. Your allegiance to the American Constitution, right up to the president, right up to the Supreme Court, comes ahead of all other allegiance have in this country. And, and I'm not threatening you or anything, but if you don't understand that, if you don't feel that, really? then you should then you should go. This is not your country. That's absolutely true. Now a lot of new people come in here and don't and <coughs> don't know that. The citizenship tests are supposed to explain that to people. People are supposed to, you know, before they my wife is a naturalized American. You know, she went and they asked her questions, she studied a handbook and stuff like that. But if you, if you haven't, uh, you know, if you haven't grasped that, that's where your loyalty comes first. Uh, in terms of even life and death, because when the situation is on the line and there's war, you're going to be drafted under the laws of that Constitution. You're going to be expected to fight. And uh, you're going to be uh, expected to put your life on the line. And if you're not willing to put your life on the line, as uh, 25 million people did in World War II, uh, then you're going to go to jail and even get shot. <laughs> so, you know, that, that is really, uh, unless you're a conscientious objector to war generally. But um, if you don't feel you have loyalty to that extent, then, then you've got a problem. You don't understand this country. So, I don't know what you were saying really, but yeah, really, really. The Constitution is coming before, and that's what the French were saying. I think we say it here in the, in the U.S. in other ways, a little more subtly than that. We don't try to make it as, uh, as hard as that. But everybody here in this room, they can have their religious feelings, sure, okay. You can be a conscience objector, that's recognized, but you're not, your religious feelings aren't just conscience objector, but you've got some other loyalty above the Constitution. For instance, let's say to Muhammad, for example. Well, this is not the country for you. Muhammad is great, but he comes second. The U.S. Constitution comes first. And, uh, you know, that's what social contract theory is. You enjoy the protection, the good graces of this country. That's what uh, Hobbes was talking about. That's what Locke was talking about. That's what Mendelssohn was talking about. You surrender a certain amount of your individual freedom in the contract uh, for the, uh, to avoid a state of, uh, of nature like you have in, in Iraq today. In Iraq today, you have basically a maelstrom a state of chaotic state of nature where the forces that want to reduce it to a state of uh, incredible killing and violence and uh, chaos and anarchy want to do that because they know that if they win they can then take over in the end with a medieval Muslim state because nobody will stand in their way so they're just going to kill and kill and kill and kill and kill and kill until you get tired and go home and they're going to kill and kill and kill and kill and kill and kill until all the liberals get tired and either are all dead or they leave too. And then who's ever left, they're going to say, okay, now we're going to give you peace, but peace on our terms. And the peace, that's fair. And the peace on their terms is going to be the Taliban type peace, that is, a total medieval Muslim constitution. 
this is a very difficult situation. I don't envy anyone caught in the middle. I don't even envy the American troops there or anything like that. But that's what we're talking about. So if we care about constitutional democracy, then the, the, the Constitution has to be a modern one. That's very difficult. Yeah. So um, in, in this country, since it does guarantee religious freedom for people, it isn't real, there isn't really going to be a conflict between... Up to a point, you have religious freedom. You don't have religious freedom to deny the laws of the United States of America. Or would they come into conflict? I don't know. Dang man. Well, uh, I'm just I mean, or, or look, we're talking about here. They said, we're, we're not talking about America. I was just saying that we have the same thing here. Forget what I said. I was just trying to draw a parallel. Mm. Look, here he's saying, you know, insofar as your laws are in conflict with our state, our state is the primary. That, that, that's what led me to that spiel, if you want to call it that, that big speech, okay? Because I'm trying to say, this is not new for the Jews. This is the same for every, in our country, for everyone who comes to so, uh, in the case of a religious state, uh, like you, you mentioned, a um, uh, an Islamic state, an Islamic state, would that mean that um, because it, it adopts religious foundations and stuff, that you're subject to those religious? Well, foundations? there is a, a religious law in Islam. If you don't observe the religious law in Islam, you can get stoned. You can have your head, you can have your head cut off. You can have your arms cut off. You can have your feet cut off. You can have your tongue pulled out. You know, all kinds of things happen to you. Right, but if that and the Taliban believes in applying medieval religious law in Afghanistan, which is why they put the burqa back on, uh, what's it called, the, the, the burqa, I guess it is, back on all of the women so they look, walk, walk around looking like they're tents with just a little uh, eye, <laughs> eye looking out. And, and a lot of uh, Muslim countries want to do that, and if you step out of line in other way, ways, you'll be killed. Yeah, you'll be killed. So if, if someone was a Jew in that state or a Christian in that state, it would be, they would have to s surrender their religious freedom because... No, we're off the subject here, we're way off, because you know, medieval Islam tolerates the people of the book. It's a very, uh, it's a very complex su subject. I'm, you, I'm sorry I brought it up. You're asking me questions that are rightful to have in your mind, but unfortunately, i got to stop because it's the wrong class to go any further in it. But we're talking about the Jews here. I've just joined the panel. I guess I think there are a lot of people, and look, the point is that all of us in this class don't seem to be descended from people who fought in the American Revolution. So we're all newcomers who have agreed one thing in common, to place ourselves under the uh, uh, legal status of the American Constitution. And we've adopted the American Constitution as our own, whether we're Jews, Catholics, Protestants, you know, Greek Orthodox, Muslims, Buddhists. Uh, Taoists, uh, it doesn't matter what you may have been. Uh, and you can so far, yeah, you get freedom of religion up to a point. It, freedom of religion doesn't allow you to go in, to a school in the uh, Quakers and shoot little girls in the head if you, that comes from religious belief he has or something like that. In other words, you, you have freedom of religion up to a point it doesn't conflict with the, with the laws of the, of, the, of the land. At that point, you have to be willing to go to prison. If you have something that you are uh, in conflict with the laws of the land, like people who are, want to have polygamy, no, I mean, I'm not against polygamy particularly uh, any more than any other form of marriage. That's their business, but the state does have some laws against it. So if you believe in polygamy and they catch you, they're going to put you in prison. So you don't have freedom of religion. Yeah. Like uh, jaywalking on Shabbat. <laughs> 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 in Israel, they might, uh, if you get in the wrong part of uh, Israel, they might throw a few stones at you for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go on. So the point is, uh, I shouldn't have brought that up, but I think it's good to have some parallels. So, uh, again, the assembly was to declare the Jews as Frenchmen, Frenchmen, page 14, and faithful subjects. And that Jewish law would yield without exception to French law. Now, on the things that there was no conflict, look, you can go to your synagogue and pray, do whatever you want, observe the Sabbath or whatever you want to do, fast on Yom Kippur or whatever. That's not conflicting with the French state or most states, except the fascist Nazi state. Uh, it doesn't conflict with the American state. But if you want to do a few things that 
are going to conflict, then the French are going to say no. And the French now, the French are having that problem now with the Muslims. What's the latest law that they just passed about the Muslims in France? That's a, that's very popular law among Frenchmen, but not popular among the Muslims. No headscarves in schools. No headscarves in schools. That was <coughs> adopted this year in France. I said, you guys aren't big newspaper readers. <laughs> no headscarves in schools. And what did uh, Tony Blair just say today, backing up his, uh, <laughs> funny, his, uh, he used to be the foreign minister, his name is Jack Straw. You know what Jack Straw said the other day? It really worked the Muslim communities up in, in, in England. He has a constituency because he's a member of parliament, just like our people have, you know, areas where they represent. His constituency is up in one of the industrial cities of the north where there are some, quite a few Muslims. And he said, I will ask any Muslim woman who comes into my office who has the, what's it, burqa on? What do you say, burqa or burqa? I think it's burqa. 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 Who has the burqa on to take it off. Uh, um, uh, I will have women present in my office, but I'm doing that because I feel that I cannot communicate with her just through isolates. If she has a problem that I have, to, I have to see her facial expressions in order. There's a communication that goes on with facial expressions as well as just isolates, uh, body language code or whatever, and I cannot have a proper com conversation or communication with her if she's going to come into my office wearing the book. If she doesn't want to come into my office, <laughs> that's fine. Keep your book on. If you come to my office, I'm going to ask you to take it off. Now, I don't know what he would do if she wouldn't. I, I didn't get to all that. Anyway, it was a huge outcry. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a gray area. Tony Blair had fired this guy from Foreign Secretary <coughs> some, some months back because he was house cleaning and getting only people who were 100% behind him because he was having a struggle for the leadership. And he came out today and supported him. He said, I support Straw on this. I think that was a reasonable uh, request that he made. And um, I don't think that uh, it was unreasonable. And you know, he threw the weight of the British prime ministership behind Straws. And that's very similar to the French, no headscarves in schools. So the European countries are getting very worried about the situation. Extremely worried. We're not worried in America much because in America everyone likes to assimilate. But if we start getting groups in America that don't want to assimilate, don't want to be Americans, there's going to be issues that are going to develop. I don't think it has happened, and I don't think it is going to happen here as much as Europe, because we don't have a we don't have a racial American the way Europeans do. We don't have a, a Frenchman. We don't have an Englishman. America is a you know conglomeration of People. So I don't think it's ever going to happen like it is. But Europe has some national identity problems that are very seriously threatened, which is what the Jewish problem was in Europe. See, the Jewish problem, in those days, the Jews were the only European minority, aside from the gypsies, let's say. The gypsies got similar treatment. Uh, and, the Jew, and the European nations felt they couldn't assimilate these people, felt there was a real issue between them, and the Jews wanted to be assimilated. German Jews, primary, more than the others. In America, again, I think, and that's the whole, by the way, oh, you people are Spanish background here in the room, that's the fight now of whether we're going to have Spanish language schools in America or not. <coughs> whether schools are going to be English or Spanish language. Sure, it's great to have a Spanish language school. And sure, Jews have Hebrew language schools, but those are all private schools. You know, if you want to go to uh, Japanese, keep on the Japanese language. They sometimes have their kids go all weekend long to learn Japanese. I don't think it's fun for them. Uh, Chinese also have that, uh, have that going on. You know, their whole weekends disappear. Uh, they break their teeth on these uh, very difficult languages, as they're with the little kids. Well, you're saying, yeah, you know something about that, right? Yeah, how many days a week would you have to go to something like that? Well, it's like, um, like they have a summer camp. Yeah. You go to a summer camp or during the like school day, it is like twice a week. Yeah, twice a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <coughs> that's fair enough uh, for these communities to try to keep their culture. It's normal that communities want to keep their culture. Uh, but 
are people going to do it in the state schools? That is, the schools that are run by the state for the citizens. And uh, that's what the issue of Spanish language schools are. I mean, you're going to have Japanese language schools then, you're going to have Hebrew language schools, you're going to have, so, you know, to make an exception for any, however big the Hispanic minority really is, it's a very, what, I don't know how many Hispanics, but 30 or 40 million now or something like that, I mean, it's a vast, vast minority now, probably uh, the, one of the largest ones, if not the largest one. I'm not even sure in some states like California, it's going to be a minority much longer. It's California, it's not a minority. <laughs> it's going to be a, yeah, it is a minority. So, um, you know, still I think though the Hispanic community has been very good about this. Most Hispanic, except for now the gang situation and stuff that we've had, most Hispanics, I'm not a great expert of the second and third generation, particularly back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe not so much today, I don't know, wanted to uh, become Americans. Uh, sure, they wanted to keep Spanish customs, food, things like that, but they still wanted to be Americans. And most of them assimilated quite happily and readily and quickly uh, after a generation or two. So the thing is that if you give communities the opportunity not to assimilate, then they may not, they, they, then they may not want to. Anyway, so that's an issue I don't know. I don't think it'll be ever as severe as Europe. Europe is going to have some real serious problems. Plus the birth rate is falling off. The immigration rate is arising. So you say, why can't they cut off immigration in Europe? Do you know why they can't cut off immigration? They don't have the population to support the social welfare system anymore. So they don't have enough young people to support the retirees in, uh, of the older people. So they have to let the immigrants come in from North Africa, Turkey, and all these other places. Uh, to increase the tax base. Denmark has to do it. Germany has to do it. Russia, the population is falling, vastly falling. It's uh, fallen from something like uh, 220 million. It's down below 150 million since World War II. I'm not talking about losing the territories. I'm talking about Russia proper. And it's still falling because they don't have any children anymore. Uh, and uh, economically, things are tough. The uh, Russian government has just started to encourage big families by giving grants to people who have more than uh, one uh, children or two or something like that. And then some other countries in Europe that are doing that, giving family grants. Scandinavian countries are doing it. Uh, Holland is doing it, so on and so forth. Because their populations are plummeting. That is, their native populations are plummeting. Their immigrant populations are rising. So, anyway. Well, we've been through all that in America. We know all this. Okay, sorry to get off the subject, but you seem interested, so I'm uh, trying to. Uh, now, I'm not a great expert. I only know a little bit about these things. Okay, so um, he called what was really a great Sanhedrin. Um, so here, first of all, the Israelite deputies of the, of the assembly speak. Gentlemen, His Majesty, the Emperor and King, no one ever stopped to think how he got to be Emperor and King, this little person from Corsica, no less, having named us commissioners to transact whatever relates to you, has this day sent us to this assembly to acquaint you with his intentions. Uh, his Majesty has convened this assembly. His Majesty has been satisfied with stopping the progress of evil. You will no doubt prove worthy of so tender, so paternal a conduct, and you will feel all the importance of the trust reposed on you and cooperate with all good it intends. Thus you will prove that, following the example of all Frenchmen, one, bottom of page 15, you do not seclude yourself from the rest of mankind. We don't want you sitting over there in ghettos anymore. We don't want, want you walking around in odd clothes. We don't want you secluding yourself from the rest of mankind, uh, like Amish or, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Mennonites and people like that in America, etc. We want you to uh, be Frenchmen, and that means be look like French. You know, Dreyfus was a French. He had adopted French culture totally. By the way, Dreyfus, I think, and again, I'm not want to make any mistakes here, I think Dreyfus is a Sephardi now. So he would be a Frenchman of long standing. 
The laws which have been imposed on an individual of your religion have been different in several parts of the world. Often they have been dictated by the interests of the day, but as an assembly like the present has no precedent in the annals of Christianity, so will you be judged for the first time with justice, and you will see your fate irrevocably fixed by a Christian prince. So these are not, I don't know if these are Jews he sent back to talk to the Jewish uh, uh, Sanhedrin that he has called. The Sanhedrin means a convoc, a Jewish assembly of leaders. No, <coughs> hasn't been called since the time of the Romans. And so, the wish of his majesty, and here it is, I think top 60 is really good, is that you should be Frenchmen. This is very vivid and very, it illustrates things really good. It remains with you to accept the proper title. Now, do you want to be Frenchmen? Or not? Or do you want to be Jews? Just Jews. You don't have to choose. You can be Jewish Frenchmen. In which case, you can be Jews, as you were trying to weigh the, what that meant, but you have to observe French law. And that takes precedence over everything else. You can continue. And it's, he was, uh, as Mendelssohn was trying to argue, so all of us in Mendelssohn, you know, we don't have any customs that are at odds with the law. You know, our, uh, our, our laws are only for us uh, as a peculiar people, but, but, but I think the French were going further than that. They said, no, 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 we're not buying that. We want you to assimilate. Is that what we want you to? We want you to be Frenchmen, and you don't, we don't want you to stay apart. Yeah, but the weird thing is, then later on, hundred years later, uh, they wanted them to stay apart. They were annoyed by the fact that they were that Dreyfus was in the was in the uh, military intelligence uh, uh, bureau. Uh, they were prejudiced against him. Because he was a Jewish Frenchman. It's, it's a very complicated situation, as you can well imagine, trying to grasp, which is why I am reading it. We're going to ask you questions. Um, by the way, if you prove unworthy of it, it would be like renouncing, you know, French are big on being worthy of it. You know, when the French went to Africa, West Africa, and got their colonies there, you know, they were different than the, uh, than the English. The English tried to stay aloof from the native populations in their colonies. The Frenchmen wanted to make all the people in their colonies little Frenchmen. That is in, uh, I can't name half the countries of West Africa, but if you went to Paris and you met the uh, <coughs> French African people sitting in the cafes in Paris. Nigerian. Oh, there is a special case. French. No, I'm talking about black African. Ivory Coast. Nigeria Coast. speaks French. No, Nigeria. I thought you meant Algeria. I thought you said. No, Nigeria. No, Nigeria. Not Nigeria. English always was. No, I'm talking about uh, <laughs> Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Senegal, uh, Chad. Um, a lot of those, but I'm not talking about North Africa. Algeria, Morocco, this was another problem. Um, and it is today, too. I mean, I'm left, these are all bad subjects, and you can do whole courses on them. But in any case, um, they wanted the people that they came in contact with to become Frenchmen and to speak French and to uh, you know, absorb the French language. I don't know if you've seen pictures of the battlefields of the First World War. The French have a lot of black African troops in the pictures, if you notice, there's a lot of black <coughs> African troops from West Africa in their army in, in the First World War. I mean, they had no, no stake in this war, but they were up there as Frenchmen giving their life for it. You know, they were there, and, 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 and yeah, they weren't shirkers either. Um, they stood on the line, and, um, you know, I don't know if they got much honor for it, but... Uh, Okay, so these are the questions French always said. You should not forget, prove unworthy of it. Say that to an African French, you know, uh, uh, colonial from different countries in West Africa. That would be very honorable. We're going to, you are going to be French. And a lot of them are very pro-French to this day in their culture. I mean, you go to West Africa, it's totally uh, 
Francophile. They succeeded where the English didn't. Well, the English too, in the countries that they were in, people began to admire English culture like India and uh, Kenya, Nigeria, but n not so much in Africa as the French. And the Indians were always split on that. They liked English Scotch, English woolens, things like that. But they didn't like the English class system, and they didn't like a lot of other things. And English didn't treat people as equal. You know, even in the, uh, in the Americas, the French treated the American Indians as equals. They intermixed with them. The French trappers would have <coughs> Indian wives and everything. They said, well, did the Indian trappers have French wives? Well, no, I didn't, didn't go that far. <laughs> they didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, French women out here to, uh, to do that. But nowadays they might, but uh, back then they didn't. But no, they had, they, 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 they had what was called, I guess you'd say, misogynation. They, they freely mixed and produced, you know, Hollywood used to love that sort of thing, you know. You know the old Hollywood westerns? He's a breed, you know, they loved that kind of, you know, issue. They made a huge issue in the Hollywood westerns uh, and of these people that were mixed. And, but the French were very widespread across their activities. And the Indians liked the French for that reason. They really did. Because the French mixed. The French mixed with them and so on. And they didn't pull snob rank on them. Okay. The English did. <laughs> and they, they never mixed as such. They never intermarried if they could if they could have <coughs> never. I don't know, they're supposed to be democratic English, but I guess they weren't. So the French wanted people to become Frenchmen. I'm not even sure any other country felt this way. As to us, our most ardent wish in the middle of the page to be able to report to the emperor. I think these are Jewish representatives who have gone and gotten Napoleon's point of view and are taking it to their assembly. And it's quoting what the instructions they've got. Um, uh, that among individuals of the Jewish persuasion, you see, this is now not nationality. It's just a religion, like any other religion. You know, as, uh, as people, you're French. You believe something else again, the way we sometimes see it in America. I don't think we always see it like that, but sometimes. Of the Jewish persuasion, he can reckon as many faithful subjects determined to conform in everything to the laws and the morality which ought to regulate the conduct of all what? French. Frenchmen. <laughs> you are a Frenchman. <laughs> This is a great Napoleonic uh, gesture. He, he, you know, Napoleon went to Egypt. You're, you're, you're familiar with Napoleon's campaign in Egypt? And he took an army, landed it on, the, unfortunately, he had the British fleet behind him. You know what happened to his uh, campaign in Egypt? The British sunk his fleet off of the coast of Alexandria. I forget what the name of the battle was. It was in 1801 or something like that. And stranded him in, in Egypt. But in the meantime, he had fought the Battle of the Pyramids. And he had made a proclamation, you know, Napoleon is uh, a Muslim. <laughs> and I invite all Muslims to become free, basically Frenchmen, you know, or something like that. And it was a huge, you know, proclamation for the time. And um, it did produce, um, as time went on over the 1800s, 19th century, the stirrings of Arab nationalism, Arab nationalism were, were, were really triggered by Napoleon's appearance in Egypt. He had to scurry back to France, ultimately but lost his whole army to the British who had ruined him there and they finally surrendered to the British. But fought some really nasty uh, campaigns there. You might be interested, it's around the beginning of the 1800s. Anyway, this is after that. He needs more army. He's lost a lot in different places. Okay, so now here are the questions that they are going to ask. So this is your question here. What's the issue here? What could be a problem? And it might relate to America too, to religious belief and tradition. Is it lawful for Jews to marry more than one wife? I thought I was right. I just mentioned that between the Mormons. No, that's just the first, the first deal. Is divorce allowed? Is it valid when pronounced in a court of justice? under the French Civil Code, not in your <coughs> religious courts only. Yeah, you can have a divorce in your religious courts, but are you going to recognize divorce under the French Civil Code? Can a Jewess marry a Christian? 
or a Jew a Christian woman? Or has the law ordered that Jews should only intermarry among themselves? Uh, I don't know, I see how they're going to answer these things. These are tough questions, aren't they? Really tough. I point it. Someone knows what he's dealing with. It's not what Mendelssohn is wrestling with. You see, the French are much, I don't say craftier, but much, uh, you know, they're not going to give anything if they can. They, they want all given to them. In the eyes of the Jews, are Frenchmen considered brothers or strangers? In either, in either case, what conduct does their law prescribe towards Frenchmen that are not co-religionists? Do the Jews born in France and treated by the law as French citizens acknowledge France as their country? There it is, I told you. You're born here in America. Is America your country or is, is, or is Islam your country? Or Buddhism your country? Or Judaism? Is France your country? These are the modern nation-state questions. I mean, I'm not trying to say they're right or wrong. I'm not advocating Trying to have some. Are they bound to defend it? Are you going to defend it? That's very important for Napoleon. Are you going to get out there and die for it? It's very important for America. We have 300 million people in America now. I think we're just coming on that this next few months, the 300 million. The time of the first uh, of the of the Second World War, you know, the people we had in this country, like I told you last time, about 140 million. About 140 million. We've doubled and then some since then. Now, it's not all birth increase. It's a lot of immigration, too. So now, are the new people along with the old people? And you know, Iraq's a nasty war. Suppose there has to be a draft to go out there. You can't just be against the war because you don't like it politically. If you're a conscientious objector, fine. Okay, people are against the Vietnam War, but that didn't get them out of it. They had to flee where, too? Canada or something. You know, are you going to put your blood on the line for your country, even if it's wrong? I mean, it may not, to, you know, all political decisions aren't right. I'm not asking you in this class specifically, but I'm saying this is the question. When it finally comes down to the point, are you willing to die for your country? You know, that's a tough question. Particularly for new people who have come from many different other places who have mixed loyalties. Now, for instance, I think one group that was very underestimated by the, I hope I'm not boring you guys with this. Am I? You're laughing at this? No, no. You, uh, have you seen All Quiet on the Western Front? Oh, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> you like Corporal Hibisthos. No, but look here. Look here. Sometimes, you know, uh, the loyalty of the Japanese Americans of several generations was highly underestimated in World War II. And then, you know, they did all this roundup and this horrible stuff, treated them uh, abominably, you know, when totally against the American Constitution. They didn't do it to the German Americans. It was pure racism and stuff that they that they did that. But then when the chips were down, what did the Japanese do? They joined the regiments. And they had the most decorated military regiments in the American army. Same for the Navajos and people like that. You know, through that kind of behavior, they earned so much respect that nobody would ever I don't think anybody would ever gainsay their rights or their, uh, or because people were astonished at that kind of love and commitment. Yeah? There actually was some um, prejudice towards the uh, German groups and stuff. Oh yeah, there, there's sure there would have been, right. But they didn't do anything specifically as putting it in the Towns got burned down, houses. Yeah, okay, the individual acts of violence like Ku Klux Klan has been doing for generations. It's got, but it wasn't a whole, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? It wasn't a government. Sanctioned. Yeah. I mean, okay, you know, people, are, people are people. They can be nasty people and good people. Anyway, okay. I'm not saying the Germans did suffer. Well, I'm only saying that it wasn't, um, it wasn't like what the Japanese went through here. And uh, the, uh, the, the Japanese so proved themselves to the Americans. I mean, the Medal of Honor winners and so on among the Japanese. That this is, I mean, I live in Fountain Valley, and I don't know if you've ever been down there, but there's a lot of Japanese small farmers down there. I think most of them lost their farms and then got them back, some of them, because some of the big uh, farms are still owned by Japanese people down there. But all <coughs> of the junior schools are named after Japanese 
war heroes from the Second World War in Fountain Valley. Every middle school in Fountain Valley is named after Medal of Honor, a Japanese Medal of Honor winner. There's the uh, Tamura School, there's the, um, I can't think of all, all of the different Masuda School, uh, you know, and they have the pictures of these boys in the front corridors. I think that's a tremendous honor. I'm very proud of that they do that uh, in Fountain Valley. I think that's a wonderful thing. And um, I think they ought to be commended for that. Uh, they honor these people uh, who made that commitment uh, to this country, even though the country didn't uh, behave properly to them. Okay, so uh, are they going to bound and defend it? Are they going to follow the civil code? Don't forget Napoleon made this new civil code. What kind of police jurisdiction do the rabbis have? Oh, that would please who? Mandelson. He didn't want the rabbis to have any jurisdiction in the community lest they misuse it. Uh, do they exercise any judicial power? What about their election? Is it sanctioned and regulated by law or simply custom? This is a very clever question. That's why I'm reading it to you. Are there professions from which Jews are excluded by their law? No, it used to be the opposite. European law excluded. But now the French uh, Revolution has said everyone is going to be given everything for citizens, equal, equal citizenship. It didn't happen to the extent that they may believe it happened, but um, that's what they said. Does the law forbid Jews from taking usury from their brethren? That is, uh, does it forbid it, does it allow it towards strangers? In other words, what's the deal here? Do they charge interest to their Brethren as well as non-brethren? Well, I can assure you, I never met a Jew who didn't charge interest to his fellow Jew as well as anyone else. Uh, <laughs> so I can tell you that if Jews are the only one taking interest, which they're not, I never saw them give their fellow their fellows a break. That's for sure. So I can answer that question right off. <laughs> I know I know people think that, but that is not the case. It never was. Go to Israel, man. You'll be uh, you'll you'll have debts. Like, you never saw them. So I uh, don't think that there's any special treatment that Jews give each other. They don't. And never have, I don't think. Not in that area, anyway. Okay, so during the reading of these questions, the assembly manifested unanimous and spontaneous emotions, how deeply affected they were as, to, uh, as Frenchmen, as attachment to Frenchmen following the law of Moses, but as Frenchmen. They didn't conceal the emotion caused by the sixth question. Uh, are they acknowledged, uh, bound to acknowledge France as their country and bound to defend it? And they all cried out, even to the death! <laughs> they got Napoleon's message, huh? And so they then got together and they gave these this response. Can I read you a few of them? Uh, I think they're worthy of reading. I know you read them, but reading them together, I think, is always uh, more effective than, uh, than to uh, do it singly. Declaration. I love this part. I love this whole section here of the book. I would assign this book just for this section if I could. I think it's so much, uh, so interesting, so revealing, so much, so entertaining, so much fun, really. Resolved by the French deputies professing the religion of Moses. I love that. We're deputies, the French deputies, professing the religion of Moses. This is a new religion, the religion of Moses. Uh, we don't even call it Judaism anymore. It's the religion of Moses. <laughs> that the following declaration shall proceed. The assembly, impressed with deep sense of gratitude, love, respect, admiration for the sacred person of the superior royal man and man and majesty declares in the name of all Frenchmen professing the religion of Moses that they're fully determined to prove worthy of his favors. First World War, they gave a lot of proof of that, both in Germany and France. A lot of Iron Cross winners among Jews in Germany who got no, no honor for it whatsoever and you know, were treated miserably afterwards. His majesty intends for them by scrupulously conforming, see, that's not like America. America did give honor to those people who, in spite of the situation, went forward with a commitment. Never, never, in fact, Reagan actually then tried to make good on that whole situation uh, of the camps and so on. Uh, 
You see, that didn't happen in Germany after the First World War. His Majesty intends for them, by scrupulously conforming to his paternal intentions, that their religion makes it their duty to consider the laws of the prince as the supreme law in civil and political matters. There it is. Their religion makes it their duty to consider the law of the prince as the supreme law in civil and political matters. I don't know if you understand law, but you have civil law and you have personal law. And then there's also, you know, political states law, you know, foreign policy and stuff. <coughs> personal law is things like marriage, divorce. Adoption of children, maintenance of children, maintenance of women in the, uh, in the pregnancy situation, maintenance of women in the divorce situation, uh, things of that kind. That's all personal status. We call that personal status. Maybe you've done any law. <coughs> I did a PhD thesis on Islamic law, so I know all about everything you know, to do with law in terms of French civil code and um, land law and everything. Most, I didn't know anything about it until I did my PhD, and then I probably could have gotten a law degree if I bothered trying. Anyway, their religion makes it their duty to the law of the prince as their supreme law in civil and political matters. That consequently, should their religious code or its various interpretations, whether you know, strict or otherwise, contain civil or political commands at variance with those of the French civil code, these commands would, of course, cease to influence in government. That's their answer. Their answer is your question, what you were raising before. You know, they say they will cease in that respect um, and govern them, since they must have, uh, Mendelssohn said, now nah, there's nothing that's going to conflict anyway, so don't worry about it. They must above all acknowledge and obey the laws of the prince, that in consequence of this principle, the Jews have at all times considered it their duty to obey the laws of the state, and that since the revolution, they, like Fr all Frenchmen, have acknowledged no others. Well, they don't make any bones about it, do they? That's it. They've just thrown in the whole, the whole, the whole baby into the bathwater. Is it lawful for Jews to marry more than one wife? Let's see how they slip around this one. It is not lawful for Jews to marry more than one wife, and then they give you the whole history of when it became not lawful. And it is true. The the description they give is very accurate. Those Sephardis have not really uh, come to a final determination on that point. Uh, since Rabbi Gershom in the 11th century in Worms, which was a, uh, I think Worms is in the Germanic uh, area next to France, uh, he pronounced an anathema, a ban, on every Israelite who should take more than one wife. So since the 11th century, it's been forbidden. But I can tell you, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's already forbidden. It's already forbidden. And uh, I think Christianity gets it from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the ban on, uh, on polygamy. And Christianity, I think, comes right out of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, to my mind, I may be wrong. Um, but I think it's a, a big influence. And uh, I can show you passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls where that is the case. I read this morning some of my students this morning, who were in the class this morning? Yeah, I was wrong this morning when I said about the uh, Eastern Jews had stopped because I thought a customer, by custom they had stopped, but it hadn't been an official ban. But uh, in the scrolls, you see, it's dead in the water. Um, so they give the history here, it's a pretty good history here. How about divorce? Okay. Repudiation is allowed by the law of Moses, but it's not vowed if not pronounced by the French Civil Code. Or it's okay. Uh, we don't consider it now. You know, that's a big deal in Israel. Uh, uh, repudiation, it's, they don't call it a divorce, you know. It's, um, you know how they do it in Judaism? I don't have time to explain all these things to you, but I'm going to take a break some, but you know how they do it? Male only. Huh? The male only can do it. Yes, the female can't do it. And and it's called a what? A bedding. No, a get. A get, there you go. A get. They give the woman a get. I don't know if ghetto comes from that or what, but they give the woman a get. G-H-E-T. And I don't know what the word originally meant exactly, but it's a bill of divorcement. Um, and Islam is similar. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you three times. It's called a divorce talaq, final divorce. 
finished. You can't, you can't come back. He can't change his mind unless you go to bed with some other man. Then you can. Then he can start the whole process over again. It's all. It's really. Uh, it's really wild stuff. It's in the Quran, chapter uh, Surah two in the Quran, if you and Surah three. If you want to read it, it's wild stuff. <laughs> what Muhammad makes of it. I, I'm not a great enthusiast for some of these uh, traditions, but uh, as you see when I laugh. Um, I display that lack of enthusiasm, but I do find them entertaining. I find them very entertaining. So I do recommend uh, the entertainment of reading the Quran. It's uh, quite funny, but you would uh, probably not enjoy uh, uh, having it um, imposed on you. Uh, you might find some some constriction there that might you might find worse. One area is in this divorce. So Judaism is like Islam, but Islam is more even extreme than. Judaism on this court. There's no female divorce in Islam either. And um, they have a revocable divorce in Islam and an irrevocable divorce. The irrevocable divorce is, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. That means you've been divorced three times, it's irrevocable. Uh, the revocable divorce is, oh, I, I come home at night, you've been a bad girl, you haven't cleaned the house, and I get so angry I yell, I divorce you. I wake up in the morning, I change my mind. I, I was only kidding. You've used up one of your divorces. If you do it three times, you can't take her back without what's called intervening marriage. It's all in the Quran. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. Judaism is pretty, traditional Judaism isn't very uh, much, you know, isn't very much more attractive in that area. And um, in Israel, how do they counter this now? How do they force the man to divorce the woman when she doesn't want to stay married to him anymore in Israel? The religious courts. Brute force. No, what they do is they, if, they if, if a woman wants to divorce a man and their rabbis consider she has good grounds you know, for his behavior and otherwise to divorce him, and he refuses to give her the divorce, the get, they stick him in prison. Like we do journalists here now who won't reveal their sources. They stick him in prison until he's, if he wants to get out of prison, he's got to give the woman the get, that is, he's got to give her the, the bill of divorcement. And he can see there and rot for some years until he finally go, oh well, gives up. I don't think there are many cases of people finally, you know, not giving in in the case to the religious courts. But that's how they do it now. Does it, it work both ways if the woman won't grant a divorce? Say it again. I don't oh, get never mind. It wouldn't work the other no, way. No, 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 no. Explain what you mean. I don't know. No, problem. I was saying if it, if a woman asks for a divorce, but a woman can't ask for a divorce. She can. Oh, she, she can go to the courts and ask okay. the courts, and then the courts do this. But if a man asks for a divorce. Oh, he doesn't have to ask for it. He just gives her a divorce. And the woman can't refuse. No. I mean, she can, but it's. It, it, I'm sure there are ways of going to the rabbi. And this is you see. Israel is a country that's not under French law. They don't have a constitution in Israel yet. They have not what they call a basic law because they couldn't get everyone to agree on it because there are too many different groups. Is it, I, I wrote all about this in my first uh, PhD thesis. It's called uh, Islamic Law in Palestine and Israel, but it treats the area of personal status quite well. It's, Israel is an Ottoman successor state. In the Ottoman Empire, before these states like Israel, Jordan, uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, Iraq, and so on were formed, Ottoman law was beginning to westernize and even took the French Civil Code in, into part of its, uh, its judicial background. But in personal status, it had what was called millets. Millets were national groupings, and it recognized all these millets, Armenian millets, Jewish millets, uh, and all the other minorities, Kurds, you know, and so on. So all these other groups were considered a national entity under Ottoman law, and their personal status was left to them. The state did not interfere with personal status within the millets. They allowed the millets to uh, conduct divorce, marriage, uh, adoption, maintenance, um, Am I losing you here? Okay, so today in Israel, as a successor state, it's still that way. Personal status among Christians is run by Christian church law, whatever, canon law, whatever it is. 
different Christian groups. There's Catholics, there's Protestants, there's Greek Orthodox, and so on. Um, personal status among Jews is run by the rabbinic courts. They don't want to give, they don't allow civil marriage in Israel yet. Israelis go to Cyprus to get married. There, there's huge fights here to, uh, to um, change that. In fact, I think one of the, of the new cabinet, the extreme rightists are all Russian Jews. They want to come into the cabinet, but the Sephardi religious party that's in the cabinet is having conversations, just read it today, had conversations with them, and the conversations are breaking down over what? Guess what? Civil marriage. The Sephardis do not want to give the, of course, no rabbi wants to give his power up, do not want to give the power of marriage up to the civil authorities. The Russian Jews are used to civil marriage from Russia. They all want civil marriage. So, you know, uh, these are things. Okay, uh, I'm going to keep you a second more here and I'm going to break. Uh, just let me finish this. Answer. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Where were we? Uh, come on, this book is falling apart. I should have gotten one of your books. Uh, mine's falling apart. Uh, let's see here. In the eyes of every Israelite, without exception, submission to the prince is the first of its, of its duties. Oh boy, they're so obsequious here, aren't they? <laughs> here we are, you know, we've done the, the surrender to Caesar, we consider you, you know, we're still surrendering. Consequently, they can no longer consider as vow the repudiation pronounced by rabbis. You see, in Israel this has not happened. Since to make it vowed, it must have been previously pronounced by competent tribunals, for in like manner as by an error, a rat of the council government, the rabbis could not, anyway, they go on like that. What are they doing? They're surrendering on the issue of marriage and divorce to the state of to civil marriage. And no fight whatsoever here. Uh, the next question. The law does not say, uh, uh, can a Jewish marry a Christian and so on? The law does not say a Jewess cannot marry a Christian or a Jew a Christian woman, nor does it say that Jews can only intermarry among themselves. And this is really crafty. <laughs> the only marriage expressly forbidden by our law were the Canaanite nations. <laughs> Ammon, Moab, Egyptians. Oh, they say our Bible only covered those things. Therefore, the other things aren't covered. Uh, there, so that's really funny. We'll take a break. I'll see you guys at about 20 of them. I'm sorry I kept you over. Very funny, don't you think? I guess you don't think so. <laughs> Am I the only one who finds this funny? Really? <laughs> <laughs>